Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean. Today, the topic is color theory. We are dealing with JL106. So if you're playing along at home with us and you want to pull up any of the items that we kind of have that we may pull out and use, you're gonna to go to the search box on jerrysartorama.com. You're gonna type in JL106 and that's going to pull up that entire supply list that we've got there. So, uh, so the, you know, there's a, a brush you see. If you see a certain color of the Charbon paint that we might pull out, anything like that, then you'll know where to actually find the item rather than have to search the website. So, um, today we, since obviously we're Color Theory 301, it's kind of like college courses. You got the 100 level, the 200 level. 300, we're kind of taking it to a different level. Um, this is more for those of you who've seen the other two episodes. It's not that you can't watch this first, but I would definitely suggest going back, seeing those other episodes, because kind of a lot of what we're gonna talk about today will make a lot more sense. So um, we're talking about color schemes and we're going to talk about color psychology. Now, it was funny in the comments on one of the other episodes that we did on color theory, said somebody said, there's no such thing as color psychology. Well, Carl Jung, 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 yeah. He actually was one of the first pioneers in developing the idea of color psychology and what types of things kind of people, I guess, relate specific colors to specific traits. Um, different kind of symbolic methods of color that we use, like a bride wears white, right? Guess what? In Southeast Asia, a bride actually does not wear white. A widow wears white. So color can actually have cultural connotations too. So if you are doing artwork specifically to go different places, let's say you're going to have a show in Australia. I mean, not all of us are going to do that. And some of us may not be doing that at all. But why not kind of look at some of the colors you might want to be using in a series of works that are gonna go there? Find out culturally what color says different colors in Australia. You might send some stuff that might not be very well received, right? So it's something to think about. Um, color can actually influence anything from how we perceive food is going to taste to us to how effective medicine will be that we will take, which seems really strange, but Think about it this way. Hot colors, people tend to think of them as more stimulants. Think about uh, like Tylenol. It's yellow and orange, right? Unless it's the white capsule. Think about the gel caps, I guess, maybe. Um, cool colors are considered more of a depressant. That can be culturally dependent, but think about like, okay, so I like naproxen sodium. That's the generic for leave. It's blue. That to me says, pain's going to go away, you're going to feel better and relaxed, and your neck isn't going to be all wrenched up. Okay, so I actually think that I prefer that. I don't think it necessarily works better, but because it's that color, to me it feels like it's going to give, it doesn't that seem silly, but I thought of that the other day when I was writing this episode, and I was like, oh. <laughs> so. I like Advil, Advil liquid gels because they're teal. Yeah, oh, see? Okay, so. Color works on Katie. Just make anything teal and that's gonna work for her. Okay, so let's start looking and talking about some of the colors. Now, I'm gonna say real quick, we've had a couple people that, and I think some of our newer viewers, that complain about that I'm going through a lot of things that seem like a lot of talky-talky and not as much dewy-dewy. I understand that and there's a time and a place for all of the different types of things we do for demos and for this. This is high level stuff. This is stuff that's going to take your art and what you're doing from, instead of just painting pretty pictures, it can take it emotionally, visually, perceptually to a whole new level if you learn this stuff. It's not fun and you have to learn. And it's not like painting pretty fun stuff while you learn. Now I do recommend that you actually practice some of the different colors, you know, color theory on even just some small paintings, some little thumbnails, have some fun with it, really learn to mix your paints, mix your complements and things like that. But this isn't like, this is unfortunately like going to class and class isn't always fun. So I'm not apologizing for it, but I'm saying that if you don't want to take the time to learn the stuff, that's gonna show in the series of seriousness of your art. Okay, so the finger waggling lecture is over. Off the soapbox. Yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> exactly. So, all right, so let's talk about red first and foremost. Red is one of the primary colors, but it's also used as a color symbol of or to portray things like danger or power. Okay? Energy, strength, and excitement. Anger or fury. Passion, desire, love, and lust. Valentine's Day, folks. I don't think we have to go any further than that. Think about a lot of the, I know it sounds goofy, Mexican wrestlers. Lots of red on the masks, right? Red and black combined a lot of times. That's like a super huge strength of power. Bullfighting. Bullfighting. Exactly. There's all sorts of different things. Think about when you've seen red. And, and I did not plan on wearing red, actually. I'm debuting a dog show outfit to make sure it's comfortable <laughs> for next weekend. But then I was like, so hey, there's, there's red. Danger. No. <laughs> um, so red does the following, actually, to us when we look at it, different shades, without us psychologically realizing it. It actually can enhance our metabolism. It can raise blood pressure just slightly and respiration rate, medically proven. So that's something that where color is having that kind of effect on us. Uh, now, related colors to those, when you're playing with art, you can kind of bump into the magentas or even the burgundies, but it may not have kind of as strong of a punch as straight out red is going to have. Think about stop signs and fire engines. Danger, right? Look, be careful. Warning. Octung. Frida? Octung. Yeah, okay. I just got my tongue stuck out. At. Um, in China and Argentina, red symbolizes luck. And it's the traditional bridal color in China. So that's pretty cool. All right, so red. Think of those things when you're thinking of red, how much you want to apply it. If you're really trying to say something in a piece that's got a lot of you know, anger, a lot of power, a lot of energy, bump the reds up in it. Maybe use a little more, put some touches in some different places. All right, so orange, one of our secondary colors. It's popular to use as a color symbol or to portray things like joy, happiness, energy. Think sunshine, think tropics, right? How many, when you're walking down the laundry detergent aisle, how many of the things are either in a sunshine, like yellow orange, or in straight out orange, or in a red orange in the containers, right? That's saying, ooh, laundry's fun. It's gonna be like a tropical vacation escape. I don't think that, but I do feel better about buying something that's brighter, happier colors for something that's a horrible thing that I have to do, right? Orange can also be used for like flames and fire, but that's also energy, right? Orange represents culturally enthusiasm, creativity, determination, stimulation, encouragement. Orange is sacred in the Hindu religion, so that's a sacred color for them, kind of like blue is for Christianity. And Buddhist monks wear orange, okay? Yellow, it's a primary color. Popularly, it's used as a color symbol or to portray things like honor and loyalty, cheer, sometimes happiness. Also, though, cowardice. How many have heard the yellow-bellied thing? You know, like if you're watching a Western, you're just a yellow-bellied, you know, whatever. It's basically calling somebody a coward, which why is that and what did that come from? I'm not sure. It's not like, I don't know, birds, yellow-bellied sapsuck or something maybe. Um, yellow does the following when you're using it in artwork. It can give a warming effect. It can help stimulate, kind of wake up and cheer the viewer. Um, it actually medically stimulates mental activity and generates muscle energy. Now, they say with little children, when it's overused in babies' rooms, it causes them to cry way more. That's interesting. I wonder if that's certain yellows, not I'm like sure. like more saturated, really bright yellows, or like a softer yellow. Um, Yellow is a big color on visibility. Think taxi cabs and school buses. Those are two things that you want to see. Taxi cabs want to stand out, so you hail them, right? School buses, you need to be able to see those for um, safety. 
of related colors to yellow are like ambers, beige, things like that. So green, green is a secondary color. It's popular for use as a color symbol of, or to portray things like growth, harmony, fertility, freshness, healing, stability, endurance, envy or greed. Think about being green with envy, right? Uh, money or finances or security. That's usually kind of tied in uh, psychologically with dark green. Confidence or intelligence, faith, truth, heaven. That was actually one of the big kind of symbolic colors for heaven. Um, <laughs> confidence and intelligence, pity and sincerity. And green is actually aligned psychologically with emotional safety. Right, it's a good, healthy, safe color. Um, the effects of green on the body, it slows the metabolism, it has a calming effect and a healing effect. Now, I mean, if it's like fluorescent green, it's, it's you know, your kind of calmer greens, I would imagine, not, not the poster green, poster board green, Katie. Fluorescent. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, now, uh, there's also the, ne the other negative connotation with green is calling somebody green, right? That means they're, uh, they're new, they're inexperienced, something like that. Um, so that could even be used in, in something where you're trying to portray somebody that's not, you know, that's brand new or not good at something um, or just very young. You could use green to that advantage to work psychologically on the viewer. Um, a related color to green, chartreuse. Whoop, whoop, another favorite of Kate's. Still in the green, that one. All right, blue is one of our primary colors. It's popularly used as a color symbol of or to portray. Katie holds up multiple <laughs> teal, teal things. That's funny. Um, authenticity is tied with blue. Compassion and spirituality is tied with blue, usually like in that pretty cobalt range, that nice kind of mid-range medium blue. Unity, significance, trustworthy and reliability. Think of men going to a job interview. What does a pinstripe suit say versus a brown suit? It looks very professional. It looks like Johnny on the spot. It looks very reliable. It's very clean, right? Uh, blues associated also with peace and relaxation, okay? The effects that it has on the body are relaxation, tranquil, meditative, calming. Related colors, of course, Katie's favorite, teal and turquoise. Um, now, blue is, uh, can also be in some cultures symbolic of heaven. And the Virgin Mary, if you've ever looked at any medieval art, no matter who's doing it, you always see Mary in blue. It's pretty much that really beautiful cobalt blue, right, Katie? Mm -hmm. That is just traditionally Gross. what you expect to see her in. So, um, so if you're trying to do something religious, if you're trying to make something have that effect, utilize that blue. I had a piece, but I couldn't really bring it in. There's <clears throat> doesn't really fit with the genre of. Yeah, there were not enough post-its to cover naughty bits. All right, um, violet and and or purple. For you purple sayers i don't like the word purple so all right popularly popularly used as a color symbol of or to portray royalty or nobility which i guess are kind of the same thing um power and ambition luxury wealth extravagance um it gives you that stability of blue with the energy of red when you got those together to make violet. Purple has been associated with over historically magic. You always see magicians robes or uh, like Merlin mm -hmm. is always in like, it might be more blue violet than violet, but you see him in, you know, his wizard's robes. Yeah. Um, wisdom, dignity, and mystery as well. Uh, related colors to violet are indigo, lavender, and mauve. Now, the reason that this was historically related to nobility and wealth um, 
and royalty was the pigments for that were so hard to get or required so much preparation like when we were talking about in the in our halloween episode about gross pigments like weird pigments how that one purple was made from the rotten mollusks or whatever that they brought out of the water and set out in the sun to rot and then had to stomp them and supposedly they did it on the really bad side of town because it stunk so bad to soak the robes but that was and it took what it was crazy amounts of muscles to produce like one pound of clothing dyed so that my friends is the cost of pretty pigment um so that is violet um i thought of when i when i was researching this about frida because one of the things up one of the websites talked about was think of the purple and gold candy bar Willy Wonka. luxury wealth no there's the brand it's not Willy wonka that was a golden ticket he didn't he didn't go for the full fancy frida's Okay. Frida's giving me really dirty looks now because I'm talking about chocolate. Um, and other figures in, like if you're in an art museum that you might see represented in purple or violet, some of the Madonnas are where either the blue is had, you know, altered over time, starts looking violet or purple. Um, cardinals have been known to be in scarlet and or purple. It just depends on the time frame um, because they were precious pigments. Um, purple symbolizes evil and infidelity in Japan. Maleficent. Huh? Maleficent. Oh, yeah. Well, she's not Japanese, but yeah, that's the, yes. Yes, she is. All right, but she's royalty also, because wasn't she a queen? Mm -hmm. Maleficent was a queen, so right there. All right, pink. Although, to me, this is a little bit of a color stretch. I'm going to allow it because basically... It's red, just knocked down as a tint. So it's got some color connotations of its own. Um, it's popularly used as a color symbol of, or to portray gentle or pure love. You got your red, that's your passion and your lust and all of the, come over here, you know. Pink, it's gentle, it's kind, it's sweet. It's tenderness, it's nurture, vulnerability, youth, innocent, sweetness, Hope and optimism pink is used for. It's also used for femininity. So anytime you're looking to kind of bring a painting down to give that tenderness, uh, think of Mary Cassatt and a lot of her pastel paintings, mm -hmm. lots of pinks, all the mother and, and children, lots of pinks. It's all very soft, very muted, beautiful colors. That's what gives those that just emotion and connection, you know, with the mother and child are those pinks. Um, now, something I did not know, up until the 20th century, blue was, at, there was a gender reversal on color. Blue was actually for girls, pink was for boys. Did not know that. Amanda looks very unhappy. No, I'm fat. Okay. <laughs> Amanda's like, meh. Yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure Maleficent was never a queen. Oh, oh, yes. okay, well, <laughs> all right. My little Disney heart was like, I don't think so. Okay, well, we we know how much Amy likes Disney. So, um, yeah. Never seen the animated one, only the other one. So, mm. All right, white, popularly used as a color symbol of or to portray light, purity, innocence, virginity, goodness or safety, cleanliness, beginning, rebirth. The color is associated with perfection and with faith. Um, brides wear white typically because that was the symbol of purity. purity back in the day. But like I said early in the thing, if you miss the beginning, in Southeast Asia, only widows wear white. You do not wear that as your marital gown. Um, so white's a good thing if you're doing something um, where you want something to look very clean, very bright. Uh, pure you want something to um either have a religious connotation to it you want something to be uh kind of like an afterlife a beginning a rebirth anytime that you want that sort of feeling that's where you're going to want to incorporate more white into your work black black is popularly used as a color symbol of or to portray power and authority Elegance or formality, death or grief, 
mystery, as in mystery, not as in like Scooby-Doo, where are you? It's like fear of the unknown, the black abyss, right? The, uh, a black hole, just all the things that don't make sense that just are kind of terrifying for reasons, but just that are very mysterious. Black is usually what you use to portray those. Evilness, uncertainty, or even depression in a work. Um, now, and combined with, with red, it can make either power or anger, depending on kind of how you've got those, how bright those colors are. Um, black also has negative connotations, a lot of them. To be blacklisted or blackballed, right? Means you get voted out, essentially. Black death. Could we just call it a plague? No, we called it something just terrible and apparently mysterious. So, um, black is used a lot in advertising. If you want something to look very affluent or serious or luxurious, think of all the luxury car companies. You typically see a lot of black, right? Or a metallic, because a metallic says money as well. All right, brown. Brown is popular as a color symbol to portray natural things or nature because um, it gives that kind of wood or dirt, kind of that earthiness to something, okay? Um, homemade. If you're trying to make something look homemade, think about wood furniture. If wood furniture is painted, you have a very different reaction to it than if it's stained, right? If it's stained, you just kind of assume it's either handmade really nicely or just it gives you a different feel than just painted furniture. Painted gives you kind of more of a cheap feeling. It's not as nice, you know? Um, brown is pop popularly used for natural warmth or strength in an art piece. Um, it's a kind of a good color representative of trustworthiness, of productivity. They said that Brown is used a lot in workspaces in varying colors and degrees, tints and otherwise, because it makes people psychologically more productive, which seems really strange to me, but I guess it's not as exciting as red, so you're not going to get all ramped up, but you're going to do your work. So, um, and maybe it doesn't make you feel like you're sitting inside all day because it's natural. And, yeah. Um, brown can also be used if you're really trying to push in a work, kind of uh, that feeling of decomposition, of recycling of kind of uh, going back to the earth, right? Um, restaurant packaged food typically comes in brown or tan packaging if they want you to believe that it's healthy because it gives that home-baked look to something. Think about Panera Bread and stuff like that. I mean, Panera does have healthier food, but think about places that don't have as healthy food, but they put it in something brown and have maybe some nice green natural printing on it makes you feel better about eating it, okay? All right, so we're gonna go over some artwork that I've done and I'm gonna tell you why I've done it with those specific colors. And then we're gonna look at some, very quickly, we're just gonna flip through some different books that I pulled out and I said, there's gotta be some color themes and stuff. Guess what? Lots of famous artists use very strict color schemes that you just probably never noticed. And I want you to look at that so you can start looking at artwork in a new life and seeing it as color schemes rather than just pretty pictures. Because it helps kind of educate you on how to do that in your own work, okay? So, um, Katie, would it be easier for me to put them up here or would it be easier for me to, <laughs> that works. Some of them might be bigger. So, okay. So we talked um, a couple weeks ago about the monochromatic portrait and I didn't have it with me. This is a monochromatic portrait in red, okay? So this is just a, a, a scarlet that is a Michael Harding painting, paint actually, that he gave me a tube of. Yes, tilt it so it's is not it, so. Not quite so tiny. Does that help? Oh, that makes Other it worse. Way. Okay. From the top. Hold on. From the top. There you go. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. I'm going to whack my hands under there. All right. That was the most colorful part. You couldn't see it. <laughs> so now it does have a green undertone to it because it was just a panel that I had that was green. But I did that purposefully so those little pops coming through would be that kind of complementary color. Um, this is an instance where I decided that with a lot of heavy use of black and gray, right, where black could be used as depressive, this was a painting that I did of my dog the day she passed away. That's fine. It's, it was a, wh a while ago. 
but but I, I needed to try the paint and I needed to report back to him the next day and that was the only thing that I could think about so it was a way to kind of get that out of me and it was a picture that I took of her kind of right before we put her to sleep but I wanted to convey kind of you know red is not that's it's a very confrontational color mm -hmm. in in this and for you know and the dog looks sad or unwell you know but it was a way of taking something that's usually powerful brighter happier and really taking black and, and gray and making taking that like lust for life out of it if you will does that make sense all right so that's how you can take a color that normally would signify a bit, 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 bit be for something else <laughs> and you can take it and by knowing how to use those other colors and what feelings those will give a viewer making it into that instead okay and we're gonna move quickly so people can leave questions if they if they miss something and, and want to talk about it okay um this little painting and, and this shouldn't be too reflective okay analogous color scheme right we've got kind of a sunshiny yellow with kind of a lighter yellow a deeper yellow uh, I know there was a Naples yellow in here, and I actually took red, but I really paled it out. But this is still analogous. We're going along only one side of the color wheel, right? And then I've got some, a little bit of um, some red, um, not red, burnt sienna in here that's very ghosted out, and then a little bit of burnt umber in here. Why did I not make those brighter? Why did I not make that? more kind of pop it's because it's a dead bird okay it had hit the the window outside and i'm fascinated with birds we had to draw a lot of birds in medical illustration college and i wanted to play with kind of a, a very unusual analogous color scheme i've not seen a lot of people use that yellow and make it a very quick study so in about 30 minutes i painted this little bird wanted to take a lot of the life out of it so that's pale pink for a reason its feet were much brighter but I wanted to kind of, I, I guess, take the, the living out of it so that it looks very, other than the pose, it looks very dead, right? Because the colors are all very flat. So this is where you can take that brown and take something kind of back from a, a trusty, you know, natural thing and make it flat and very lifeless of this bird. Okay? So an Alex color scheme. Really? You didn't know I was going to bring a dead bird, did you? <laughs> I did not, or I might have cried a little. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we've started off with two very happy pieces. I apologize. <laughs> All right. Um, now, we've got this is... Doo -doo -doo. Um, we've got kind of an analogous color scheme going on here with violet, right? It's not black. It's actually violet. It looks very black on here, but it's violet straight out of the tube, mass tone. I'm sorry, what color was that? Violet, Rita, violet. <laughs> purple, violet, purple, yes. All right, so we've got some magenta, we've got some pinks, we've got some lilacs, we've got kind of everything going on here um, with that analogous color scheme. So light variations of mixing some white with it. There's no black with it. This is just that violet itself. And then on the side, I've actually got the red added with some of the, um, gosh, what? What was that brand, Frida? Do you remember the Pebio foil is is on the side of it? So we do have the red in that analogous color scheme, besides the violet and red, violet, magenta, and all that. So it was the Pebio foil. Yeah. So that's uh, an analogous color scheme. Now, what I was going for there was just kind of that kind of wondering what's going on here with this kind of scene. It's a self-portrait, but it's a I, I noticed my face was only in light in one spot and in darkness in the rest, and I really liked it, but then I wanted, played with making it kind of, I did some with blues and I did some with the reds to see what feeling each of the colors would give it and kind of what feeling that outline of the magenta would give it. Um, just to kind of play with what, what, using these colors, what emotion is this giving the viewer? So this isn't even necessarily a purpose. This The purpose of this was to try this color variation together. Alright. Now we talked about triadic color schemes before. 
Um, I'm going to show a couple different ones. Let's slide this down. So this is a triadic color scheme, and we'll show one that's very basic in a minute. We've got a nice quinacridone red here in the background. We've got our blue, and we've got our yellow. There is yellow in all this. It's been toned way down um, with black or with some of the blue. You do see a little bit of green, but that's still using just those, you know, that primary or triadic color scheme. It's got the black. There's some blue even in the feathers. Now, wow, that turns out really black on the camera, doesn't it? Okay, it's not as black in person, but I think it's got a lot to do with the... Um, it looks nicely jewel toned on the... Mm -hmm. Okay, the good. Because it's like... It's not I can sorry, barely, it's not okay, good. I can barely see it. So, um, so that's what that is. So you've got your red, blue, and yellow. Notice how I've taken the black. This picture, the, the photographs that I took, I did a lot of life drawings of this little cute little girl. She's very sweet, but she was very intent about the tomatoes I would bring her. So she would look at you like, I'm going to snatch that out of your hands. So I wanted that kind of evil look to it, right? So I put a lot of extra black in here around the eyes so that that red would really kind of give that almost um, malintent kind of look like she wanted to peck you and kind of, you know, lit the beak in a certain way with some of the yellow to make it more look like she was even most maybe moving her mouth kind of back and forth like she's trying to decide whether to snag you or not. And then really over enhanced the black, made it a lot blacker because why? It's villainous, right? It's evil looking. Adding that in really kind of sets that much more dramatic look to the bird, which makes her look angrier than she really was. She did like her tomatoes, though. All right. Then, let's see, where's my... So, same color scheme, but see, used very differently. Much, much happier, lighter, almost more pastel um, with the red, blue, and yellow there. Okay. The watermelon we did, I did it dark like that for a purpose because with that, and, and forgive this, we, we tried showing in, in one of the acrylic lessons what that varnish looked like versus non-varnish to bring that sheen up and see how much brighter and vibrant those colors would be. But see, we've got, we've got the red, we've got the green, we've got the burnt sienna in here, which is just that natural pigment red, and then we've got um, the black going on there. So what, what kind of color scheme is that? Complimentary? What, Frida? All right. I'm, I'm just giving Frida heck because she's picking on me. She knows. And I'm gonna be in trouble when we're done. All right, um, let's see. Oh, we've got one more. Okay, so this is a much more extreme. Um, <laughs> do, do I need to explain first? Okay, so the naughty bits are covered with post-it. Please don't laugh. But this is this is a painting that we've got here. All right, so. What we've got going on is probably mostly considered a split complementary. It started out as I really liked the red. This was actually a throwaway canvas that they'd done a demo on and they painted red velvet and I really liked what it looked like but I didn't like the colors. So I played with it and tried to make it look more like veins and kind of this very angry landscape and added the orange and everything and the yellow and it was just gonna be analogous. And then when I got to the figure, I or didn't know what I was going to put in it and wanted the figure, but I was trying to convey emotion here, right? So what way, with this being so hot, would a change make that would give it a completely different feeling? Temperature variant. I can see the words on your tongue, Frida. <laughs> you know, You're going to say if it I, for me anyway. If, I, if so. I'm going to be in trouble, I'm going the whole way. <laughs> So we've got the blue here, right? And then we've got orange, or kind of a, a you know a yellow orange, and then we've got much more of a red orange going on. So that is our split complementary because you got the blue and the orange would be your true complements, right? So the color change is to make this seem more like stone, to make this seem more immobile. There's there's no arms that also helps. So we're we're talking about besides color, we're going with symbolism. Um, so we've got 
that color change that really plays together. Now, what makes this unusual is typically the rule is, it's not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but the unbroken kind of rule is, you use your cool colors in the shadows and your warmer colors as the highlights, typically. But that's what, I, the reason I chose to do this is it makes it more confrontational, it makes it more uncomfortable because of the fact that it's kind of breaking those rules that you're used to seeing. You don't know why when you're looking at it, if you don't know anything about color theory, why it seems really odd, but that's what it does, okay? So, all right. Does anybody have any questions so far on these? Okay, so we're gonna start going through, if, if they have them, holler. We're gonna start looking at some books really quick. Um, so, all, yes, Frida, sorry. I have a question. Okay. Well, Jeff Barlow has a question. Okay. He would like to know how you can tell which color in a color scheme is going to be more dominant. Is it the amount that you use, or is it the way the color attracts you that makes it more dominant? Think about, okay, so we just talked about, Jeff, we just talked about um, kind of the strength of color and what types of things each color is going to bring to the table for you to give a painting a certain feeling. Um, so when you decide what you're going to do, think about a, a painting isn't, is more than just a pretty amalgamation of colors that makes um, something pleasant to look at, okay? Think about little lady flower art. It's very pretty and it can be done really well. What does, do you come away thinking about that? Oh my God, that was so pretty. It just looked like a Renaissance painting. You very quickly forget that. So sometimes to, to really make an impression on people and to stick in their you know cross, so to speak, you need to determine what am I trying to say in this piece? What needs to be the most important thing? And as you're fashioning that, um, kind of desire that you've got for how you want them to see this or subconsciously interpret this, okay? Because unless you're writing it down, people are going to come up with all their own crazy things. But you can give them feelings with those colors. So f decide which feelings you're wanting to convey. Think about the colors that are going to help you convey that the most. And then start looking at, uh, you know, if you're doing a, say, or, you know, a something that you want to be really angry. You might want to, if you want it to be super angry, you want to play up the reds to the hilt, right? Uh, you might do a red and green. You might have little to no green on there, or it's going to be in little pops, or it might even be in really strong little patches that are going to make that red vibrate and seem even angrier. If you're just conveying just being a little annoyed, you want to tone that red way down, right? You don't want that red to be like, punch you in the face, Mexican wrestler mask. You want it to be much more relaxed and but not that pink that's going to convey kind of the contentment and that if that makes sense so the best thing you can do is do little thumbnail sketches with color you can use i use watercolor a lot even though i tend to work in acrylics and oils just i use very saturated watercolor so i can very quickly see what how much to kind of pop something up or I don't like this red green color scheme for what I'm doing. Let's try it with this. Let's try it with this. Let's try it with a split complementary. Play with the color to get those feelings of kind of what you're wanting to do with it. Also, when we go to talk about um, composition, that's where you play with composition too, are in those little kind of thumbnail vignettes. Because better to do a whole bunch of little ones of those and it only take me maybe five or 10 minutes for each one if you're being kind of diligent about it, then work on this great painting, you've invested four days into it, you go to get a cup of coffee and really stand back and look at it, and you're like, that composition is horrible, and what was I thinking about the color, okay? Is that good? Are we good? Any other questions? Okay. All right, so we're looking at Van Gogh first, and I've picked artists that, there's so many other artists to go with, but these are ones that you can go on Google Images, type in that name, and pull up a bazillion, I mean, not a bazillion, but you know what I mean, ample paintings to look at the colors of. And this is what I want you to do. This is what makes you as an artist better and have a better eye for color, is looking at other people's work, not just as, wow, look at that painting, as what colors were they using? What feeling were they trying to convey? What What is this saying to me? Okay? All right. Okay, so I might have to tilt these a little bit. So we've got a complementary color scheme going on. What do we have? 
blue and orange, right? So we've got that complementary color. He has some other colors, but those are colors you could make by mixing the blue and orange in there. He might have added a little here and there, but for the most part, overall, this is a blue and orange complementary color scheme. All right. What is that saying? I think it's it's tranquil and looks. It's he's got some energy going on here with the red, but he looks very relaxed and kind of in the moment, right? In the painter's zone. All right. Again, blue and orange. There's a little bit of red in here, so you could say this is kind of with the, you know, yellow, it could be red, orange, and so it could potentially be considered a split complementary uh, where it's going across and it's going, instead of orange, it's doing the yellow, orange, and the red, orange, but that's a really fantastic example of that color theme. This is beautiful. I'd forgotten about this painting from him. Um, I hope that looks a lot more red and green on you guys' screen. Does that look really chartreuse on you guys' screen? It looks yellow orange up there. Oh, okay. All right, so this is a great red and green piece that I just love of his. He does have a yellow book in there, but that's a pretty good good deal. And I've not really seen anybody work a lot with oleanders. So yeah, that's it's more pretty. chartreuse. Okay, good, because that's a beautiful piece in that screen. All right, <clears throat> analogous color scheme, right? We have a little bit of some lighter kind of greens and then it's going all the way into blues through the blue greens into blues. It's got some really nice indigos in here as the shadow instead of black. But I love, what I love is he's gone back in to really highlight that blue and give it energy. Remember how orange is that sunshiny energy, right? Even though it's like more of an evening nighttime kind of getting on the border of nighttime stroll, there's these beautiful little pops of kind of a, a nice evenly tempered orange, maybe like a, even a Indian yellow or something that are in there that give a little bit of energy, little ribbons of it right there. All right, last Van Gogh. We've got a really bright analogous color scheme going on there to the point of where this lady is really green. So we've got yellows going into the greens, going into almost blue. Um, and then the little baby's got just little peaks of kind of a very subdued red in there for the face, just to kind of make that stand out versus the rest of this. Her hand has a little bit kind of pointing you back up to that little baby's face and his little hands here do. But overall color scheme, we've got an alley going on there. Okay. Any questions about any of those guys? All right. Moving on to the next artist, Georgia O'Keeffe. She can have a field day with her and color theory. Okay, this one here with the leaves. Oops, sorry, I got a K. Monochromatic. See how we have a nice scarlet and then we've kind of, there might be a little bit of burnt sienna in here with this, but otherwise you can see the red kind of tinted or down with a little gray there. All that nice red, black, and white in this picture. Very nice, all right. Next one, this we're looking at the yellow one. Got an analogous color scheme here. This is my absolute favorite work I've ever seen of hers. It's in the Art Institute of Chicago. Beautiful work and it's not very large. So I was surprised by after seeing some of her other work, the, the vibrancy of this and it's, it is lemon stream and punch you in the face yellow in person. I had never seen anybody use that much yellow where it just didn't look off the rails. And it was just so remarkably done. I used a very little yellow and I went back as when I was in college and painted in yellow for forever trying to like figure out how the heck she had done that where it came out that successfully, but you could still see this kind of little bits of green for the veins and stuff that weren't kind of overkill. Too much, you know, too much vibrance playing off of each other. It was just so masterfully done. I was incredibly blown away by that. Uh, all right, beautifully done, blue and orange complementary color scheme. See how we've got the little 
twinges of it kind of that's very muted on the, the pelvis bone. We've got that little strip. It's just like little blush bits of kind of almost a salmon in there. Just remarkably done. And really when you see these pieces, especially from kind of this series of things in person, you realize just how much color theory is in that. Something she's not as known for, but it's a cityscape, which is what? Another blue and orange composition, right? See, we've got the little, some of this is burnt sienna, but it still kind of plays into that. It's a kind of a warm earth tone, orangish red all in here softened up in here just this beautiful kind of without even realizing it that's what you're looking at that that gives a lot of strength to a piece that otherwise might not look as successful we have a split complementary with violet and a red kind of a little bit of kind of a, a yellow orange and a little bit of kind of almost a yellow green here right probably an ochre but it's pushing that i think split complement because there's no true yellow in here to it's more of kind of that split around your yellow that you're getting some nice kind of color vibrations in here with that um and then with kind of that darkness here it really makes those colors come forward and pop even more Okay, so that's Georgia O'Keeffe. Pull out any of her works or look at those online and it's just color theory all over the place. All right, Jimmy was talking about John Singer Sargent um, and I, I was like, yay, because I love John Singer Sargent. So um, we're going to look at some of his paintings. Now this is a very masterfully done the red one here portrait that is a green and red complementary you barely see the green it's only probably in the shadows where it's making these darks there's some little touches in the skin tone there's some little touches on the shoe and then you can see a little bit kind of playing around the side of his face for those cool shadows one of the prettiest portraits i think that he's i've like got this like top 10 katie if we with the portrait contest, it's like my John Singer Sargent top 10. Yes, and anytime I see them in a museum, I'm like, ah! Makes me so happy. That is just beautiful. And I've never seen that. That's in Los Angeles. I That's like bucket list material right there, that painting. All right, so this was an incredibly scandalous painting. Madame X is exactly who I thought about when you were talking about the colors of the black, the mystery, and the forbidden, and the... Yes, Glamour and that's and why I was list. had to use Madame X. This again, another complementary color scheme with our red and our green. This might not look green, but it is very, it's, it's like an olive green in the background. That black has that elegance and kind of the power. She looks very glamorous. She is very society. Notice the red though in the lips and the nostrils, a little bit around the eye, but that ear. Okay, because he was he wanted to paint her as soon as he saw her and met her. And the reason was because he knew that that was her beau, not her husband. Dr. Posse, she had an affair with him, yes. And so that's why he did the red ear was just because that was considered very scandalous. That was considered very sexual at the time, was that little bit of red um, with the red lipstick and then you can see your hands are, are more red so that was a very um, this piece was very talked about very a big to do yes and that was I when I went to the Met for the first time I did not look to see what was where because I didn't want to know what excitement I was walking into because then I was afraid I would like run to go see some stuff and miss a whole bunch of yeah. other things walked into the room literally started going, yeah! <laughs> like jumping up and down and clapping and then burst into tears and this white lady looked at me like oh look you're special that's really sweet <laughs> it was just like no, that's my favorite painting in the world this one as well is in there and this is beautiful and it's just gigantic 84 inches 84 and a quarter inches tall red and green complementary colors again 
See, even in the gray of this blouse, you can see little pops of pink. Um, you can see some of the kind of very kind of grayed green in the skirt. His suit is that and everything is in the gray. And I love how this guy's face is totally grayed out, even though it's the husband and wife. So that's just, and, and look how radiant it, she is because of kind of that, there's enough green around her where she really just pops. It's just beautifully done. Never realized how much red and green he did, Katie. Yeah, me either, actually. It's, and going through this book, I was like, it's again, it's again, it's again. Once in a while, I was like, ooh, blue orange. Yeah. Another red and green. Again, he, with that other one of those, the, you know, the couple just there, lots more green. This, going back to the brighter red, using the green in just these little shadows and kind of almost nicking it out like a sculpture, just taking these little points and pops where that green is in there that makes it nice and bright. Okay, so that's Singer Sergeant. All right, now, last one, the guy because that's, there's some very nice blue and orange. I just wanted people to see this. Look at how nice that is. The blue, so much blue, and then little bits of orange here and there. Little orange kind of right here on this little clock. Little touches of orange and then kind of the gold. Just a really, really kind of peaceful piece. oil works. We're going to look at one of the pastel works. Again, blue and orange. Look how nice that is. Those rich, rich blues. Almost into a little bit of a blue violet here. You can see some really pale kind of almost salmon-y colors drawn across. Just very, very pretty. Then talk about monochromatic. Look at that. Isn't that wow, beautiful? Yeah. And that's an oil. No, there was only one pastel in here. We all know of Degas from pastel, but he does some beautiful oil work. And that is just, I, I don't know how you use one color that well, and it kind of looks like so many different things in how he did it. So, let's see, there's one more, one more. Oh, this is just, look at that. Analogous, but look at the, those little pops of orange in there that just make that blue absolutely sing. Isn't that beautiful? Now that is a painting that evokes feeling. Jeff Barlow is asking that he noticed the blacks and the whites and the color schemes and is curious if using them can disrupt the harmony of the piece. Uh, I don't, well, you don't want to, you want to use those to lighten your colors and, and darken your colors. You don't want to use those, the blacks and the whites, um, to kind of monopolize them, right? Um, you really have to be painting in a very specific style to really let that black and white overtake it. Black and white are there as your tools. They're not there as your main colors, in my opinion. Now, there's, if you're doing, like, there's a singer sergeant of a girl in a white dress, and I accidentally did not mark it. If I knew where it was in the book, I'd pull it up, because that's where you see white featured in an, a painting where it's very obvious, um, and it's used specifically for that. So it, just use them to alter your colors to lighten and darken. Don't use them as so much colors themselves, and then it's not going to be a problem. They're not going to fight with it. All right. So... Um, any other questions, ladies? Um, a couple of people asked what are popular color schemes these days that will sell? It's, uh, it's not, okay, we're, we're, okay, so let's back the train up because I think some people have kind of, um, gotten excited about color and that's awesome. Missed the boat on maybe what color schemes are for. We talked kind of a little bit ago and maybe they just joined us, so that's, I'm going to let it slide this time. Think about what emotions you're wanting to convey with this painting. That one doctor, the guy with the red, he was a doctor. You, red was power, right? We just talked about that. The whole freaking painting is red, wasn't it? So, but it, was, it wasn't like angry power. It was just very powerful and very energy. And he just looked like a very vibrant. He was using 
portraits of somebody that he was being hired to do and picking colors to convey who those people were and just say something about them, about what his view of them was. Not just like, hey, so I'm gonna show up in red and you're just gonna paint this. He was like, there's a reason to make this just sparkle. Let's make this have kind of its moment and its say about you as a person. So you're gonna want to pick the color schemes that are gonna convey what you're trying, the message that you're trying to show in your work. Because what happens is when people have an affinity for an artwork, they do on a visceral basis, right? They might not be able to put their words into an explanation of why they like it. They just know that it hits them, that it hits them hard, that they just have this affinity for the work and they want to buy it. If you're catering your color schemes to what's popular right now, that work is going to get thrown out when in five years they redecorate the kitchen and they put it in there because, oh, it's pretty and it's green and I like green and my kitchen's green. Oh, green's not in anymore. I'm going to paint it something different and there goes the little painting, okay? You're, you're wanting to, unless, unless you're painting because you have got to eat and that's what's going to put food on your table, that's when it's, it's okay to paint what's popular. You just need to, you're, you're not using as much of your soul in it. So you may not be as happy as an artist, if that makes any sense, right? Okay. Um, if you're using a color scheme, complementary, split complementary, all of that, um, is there a rule of thumb regarding how much of each color that you should use? Like a no, there's, there's not. And, and what she's asked is, is gonna tie in with what I wanna show you before we end here. And we're kind of running short on time, but I do wanna show you this book because if it's something you can pick up somewhere and you're really wanting to become a student of color, I think that this is gonna be a really good shot for you. Um, it's called The Yin and Yang of Painting and it's written by a Chinese artist and I'm probably gonna butcher the name and I should have, I, I couldn't get an answer back from my brother-in-law who is native Chinese, but it's Hong Yin Zhang, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, the girls will type his name in the in the notes, I hope, so you can just let people know what the guy's name is. Because the book is out of print, sadly, which, why, somebody needs to just smack this publisher. I mean, maybe the publishing, maybe the publishing house is out of print, and if they buy the rights to it, right, you're not going to get it. But it's called The Yin and Yang of Painting. If you can pick it up at a used bookstore or, or somewhere online, you need to, because this guy paints in a way where you're assuming he's using most of the colors, he is absolutely using only complementary colors in his painting. He does. He has a red green palette. He has a purple yellow palette. I said purple. He has a blue orange palette. But the way that he mixes the colors and the things that he does in how he he takes very Asian principles and applies them to how color works. And I will say that as much as I know about color and as much as color makes me happy, I would read three parts and then I'd be like, I have to put this up until tomorrow because my head is gonna explode. There's so many ideas. It was just one of those, it, it took a whole weekend to go through it, which it's not that many pages and there's a lot of pictures, but it was more the concepts of, I had to set it aside and let it marinate and really think about that and to come back to the next point and go, oh yeah, I totally get this. Um, if you've ever had a book like that, that this is this was that book for me. And a very wonderful Hope Camito Mallet sent it to me as a gift and it just made me so happy. I think I posted it on Facebook. And that was before I read it and then I read it and I was even happier. But I, I want to show some of these so you can see, if, if you'll do the overhead, Katie, that these are actually limited palettes. But they're so beautiful. This is red and green. But the way he's done it with, because he uses, a, as we've talked about color before, remember how we talked about cool yellows and mid yellows and then warm yellows where you've got a much greener yellow and then you've got a much hotter yellow that's more almost like an orange. That's how he's using it. He's using the cool, the mid-tone and the warm color and then he's doing it with the green as well. And then he's taking natural colors like you could put a burnt sienna in here with it because it's kind of a natural, or I guess with this one, he does like a raw sienna, which is a natural yellow and a yellow ochre. And he gets all this color out of it. And you can actually mix some of the greens and the, the or the greens and the reds together, and you will actually get what looks like blues, what looks like other tones. Um, let's look at a couple of these. Let me find some of the Pilgrim ones. These are absolutely beautiful. 
okay, this is a really nice one, not the Pilgrim ones, but this is um, a blue and orange palette here. You would never know that looking at it. But look how beautiful that is. And he talks about how the shadows and the highlights are that yin and yang, right? He assigns them to color temperatures. He assigns the yin and yang to colors themselves. Um, he spent some time studying um, in Mongolia, and this is a red and green color composition. Look at that. You would never know. You, it looks like there's blues. It looks like there's other colors in here, but that is just using those, that, you know, stuff on his own. Did he start this way overnight? Did he put some colors on his thing and was like, yay, I've mastered the red and green color palette? No. He, he did it for a long time, but it's showing that you can actually... Look at these. This is just beautiful. So if, if it's something you're interested in, if it's something that you, you know, want to learn how to do, there's some really nice ones. How to really be able to control color. These are just beautiful. This is, this is the blue and orange palette. But look how nicely that plays together. All right, so after reading this book, I decided to take some little, to try it myself, to see, okay, this is where I'm using the colors more boldly. This is where I'm actually taking the green and trying purposefully not to make it look like there's green in that. All these colors, this is only warm and cool reds, and then kind of the warm and cool greens and those mid-tones, and a little bit of black and white. This is obviously the, the violet and yellow palette, but look at the nice tones in between so you can get that really read more as grays, that really read more as browns, that really in some of these places read more as kind of like blues. That was reading the book this weekend, and that was trying a couple of these out just to see kind of what it would do and how it worked. This was the first one, second one, third one. Felt like I was starting to kind of get the gist of it. So you can see that progression. Does anybody have any questions? Now, good cheat sheet charts are the like the, the magic color mixing guide back here. Sorry, knocked over painting. So you've got that to kind of help you and to be able to see if you get some of these specific colors that you want to use a palette like that. You can look at them and see with those other colors that you might be using what your colors are going to come to to be able to kind of know ahead of time if you don't have a lot of time to mix or you know you tend to be a very impatient artist, which that's we all are at a time, but for the learning curve, you need to kind of slow down and take a breather and, and do that. And then another good one is the Magic Palette, the little hand color mixing guide, because you can actually see what these colors look like with just the color itself, adding black, adding white. So you can kind of start seeing where that's going to help you pick. If you pick, you know, the, some of these colors specifically as your color palette, you'll have a better idea of where you can go and what you can do with them. All right, are there any further questions? Okay, I will do, I, I meant to get to uh, work on one of these little ones with the blue and orange palette. I haven't tried that yet. I will do that and put that up by next Tuesday in the Jerry's live uh, private Facebook group. If you're not a member, you do have to be a member of Facebook, unfortunately, and I know some of you you know, prefer not to do that, and I understand. But if you do wanna see some of the stuff that we do on the show that we show kind of the after, um, that's, you just go to groups on Facebook, you type in Jerry's Live, that pulls up. You're going to need to answer the question just so we can make sure you're not a robot. And, uh, and then you'll be in that group. And it's a really supportive, really awesome group. People are always talking about all sorts of neat, cool concepts, showing work, getting critiques. It's just an awesome group to be in. So, uh, so I will show that in there. Um, I can also put up my color notes. I'll put the color notes up when I put the painting up as well so that they'll have kind of, you'll kind of have the cheat sheet version of the um 
of what each of the colors kind of can do for you as an artist, okay? So, all right, well, next week, we are using the Turner Acryl Gouache Smart Set of 20. Uh, that's got the little cool color mixing guide. It's a little guide like this, but it has what, 200 something colors in yeah. it, Katie? It's something ridiculous, maybe it's 120 colors. But out of those little colors, you can make all the colors in it and we'll show how that works. We'll pick some colors and we'll just try to mix them so that you're seeing me not practicing ahead of time. I'll have the girls pick the colors. I know we'll do teal or turquoise, Katie, don't, don't worry. That'll be first. Uh, but we will have that and we'll, we'll talk about that and kind of what that type of acrylic gouache is used for, what it can do for you. But we're going to we'll practice some of the mixing, but we're also going to show you can paint on anything with this stuff. And we did a did five little glass, like, I guess they were plexi pieces of a bug and did the bug at different layers. So it looks 3D. I love that one. So I'm going to pre-prep some of those in advance and we'll kind of add on to it. And then we'll have a really cool, like, piece and we'll put it in a frame that's designed for that size so you guys can see what it would look like finished. Okay? That is next week. So um, start looking at some color, pull up some artists, look at some Google images, start really looking at color and how other artists use it because that helps you have kind of, uh, helps you look at your own work more critically and gives you better ideas to improve your own color use. Okay guys, take care. We'll see you next week.